I'm gonna share my testimony with you and that's not something I need to rehearse. <laughs> um, but it is something that I haven't shared with anybody. Not everything. It's not, a matter of fact, I, I shared with my wife some things this morning that she did not know because I knew that I had to bear them. I had to speak the truth. And um, hopefully it, this impacts somebody here and hopefully what I have to say, somebody can use it. But I know for a fact that me saying it, I can use it. So it's a long story and <laughs> I don't want to get monotonous, but I did not grow up in a Christian home. I did not. My parents um, were not Christians. They never spoke of God. Matter of fact, my mom and dad were divorced when I was two years old. I never knew mom and dad. Um, I had a dad that I saw maybe once a year growing up in my life till I was about 15. Um, my mom was married four times by the time I was 15, and my dad was married five times. And I remember most of my childhood living with a single mother. So do the math. <laughs> um, and God was not a part of our life. Jesus was not a part of our life. I did not grow up, grow up knowing who he was. I grew up thinking Jesus was a Hispanic kid I went to school with. And somebody else pronounced it different. Um, I was introduced to drugs at a very early age. At 11 years old, I was taken to a house full of, uh, full of people who were overdosed. And I didn't know if they were dead or laying there what, but there was needles everywhere, the kitchen, the bathroom, the living room, and it kind of freaked me out. And uh, I, I didn't know. And, and we were there because the guy that had taken there, one of my mom's boyfriends, his ex-wife had passed out, and I don't know if he was going to get her to take her to the hospital or what he was doing, but I didn't know what I was doing there. Um, but it, it freaked me out. And I guess part of me should be thankful because needles always scared me. Drugs never did. Um, I got high for the first time with my mother at 13 years old. And, uh, and that's when it began. I knew that I needed to make money. How do you make money when you're 13 years old? I got a paper route, but that didn't pay very much. And I needed money. So I began stealing. And not stealing from my mother, because we were broke, but true crime. I was, I was stealing cars, stealing stereos, breaking into cars. Robert Schuler's church, the Crystal Cathedral, was two blocks from where I lived. And I was out there any night they had service, checking all the car doors to see whose cars were open. Um, it, it was just my way of making money. Learned how to drive a stick shift in a stolen car at 14. It's, these are not things that I'm proud of, but they are who I was. It was, it was the only life I knew. It was the only way I knew to make money. Um, at 11 years old, the same man that took me to the house uh, with the drug people was... Uh, he gave me the sex talk. The sex talk was, you're old enough, here's a stack of adult magazines, figure it out. I'm 11, I'm in sixth grade, and I know I'm too young. But I don't know what normal is. I have nobody to show me what normal is. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. So me needing to make money, I ripped all the pages out of the magazine and took them to school and I sold them. And I got money. <laughs> Because sixth graders will pay. <laughs> by the time I was 15, I was wanted by the Anaheim Police Department, the Orange Police Department, and my mom didn't want me to go to jail, so she had me go live with my dad, a man that I didn't know, who lived in Lancaster. And I remember driving up here the whole way. I mean, you can imagine coming from Orange County to Lancaster, and in the car all the way, I'm thinking... The day I turn 18, I am out of here. And I'm not 18 yet, but I'm going to be. <laughs> well, I got here, and nothing changed. You know, it, it took me a while to meet friends, and, and I made friends, and they weren't quite like me, but eventually I found the ones that were. 
and I was into the exact same thing, only now I'm a little bit older. So now it's about drugs, crime, and sex. Because like it or not, as a teenage boy, I'm already a sex addict. Thank you, whatever your name was. <laughs> um, it didn't, it just got worse, you know. By the time I was 18 years old, I had already participated in two abortions. I didn't know any better. Th that was the culture. That's what I thought was normal. That's what I thought my choices were. I'm too young to have a kid. I don't have a choice. I have to do this. And now I'm completely wrong. And I don't know where those girls are. I have no relationship whatsoever with them, but, but I know that it happened. At 19, I was arrested and convicted of armed robbery. Went to jail. And that didn't change me because I knew what I knew. So I got back out, immediately the same thing. Sex, drugs, crime. That's what I knew. That's how I made a living for six years at that point. And uh, I met my wife one night and we hit it off. And, and I think it's because she liked the bad boy and she didn't try to change me. So this was working out for me because I could keep doing what I'm doing. She was cute. Everything's good. Um, and our relationship went as the world's relationship goes. We have sex. We then find out if we like each other. And eventually, if the topic comes up, we'll talk about God, which is completely the opposite of God's plan. God wants you to have a relationship with him first and then find out if you like each other and then get married and have sex. It's so, but that's the plan we knew. That's her and I both. That was all we knew. That's what culture taught us. So we became pregnant early on. And we decided to have an abortion. So here I am, 21 years old, already had three. And to me, it's not phasing me. I am numb to it. But looking back now, my heart breaks for how it impacted her. Because it wasn't my decision, it was our decision, but still that she had to go through that. And I regret that constantly. Not that I was ready to have a kid. I would have made it. I'd have made it work. But having a kid, it kind of took the crime thing out of me because I really didn't want to go to jail because I had a child to support. How am I going to do that? I got to take care of this kid. But drugs, I can still do drugs. And I did and constantly did. And, and she knew and she was okay with it. But the only, you know, I kept it out of the house because I knew people that did it in front of their kids and to me that just was offensive. So I, it was in the garage. I lived in the garage, it seemed like. But it wasn't in front of my kids. So five years pass and I'm addicted to drugs. I'm high every day and every day... I wake up and I say, I don't want to do this anymore. Let today be the day that I quit. And I don't. And I can't. And sometimes I make it all the way till 6, 7 o'clock at night. But no, I got to go. Honey, I got to leave. And I'm gone. And I can't do it. And I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. And at this point, I don't know what's left. But I'm not at the bottom of the barrel, apparently, because I'm still doing it. And... One night she comes to me, and I, I have a best friend, had a best friend then that, that was very close to me, and we were very compatible. <laughs> all, all of our, we were, he got arrested with me. He was into all the same things I was in, and many people here know him. And there's people in here that know me then. Um, and they can tell you that I'm not that person anymore, that, that for me to say this is completely opposite of who I am. But anyway, his girlfriend... She had given her life to the Lord a while back, and, and there was issues. And we knew it, but, we, you know, I just, we, we avoided her. We liked her, but I didn't hang around. But Lori and her were friends. 
And she invited Lori to a revival meeting at uh, Springs of Life in Lancaster. I don't know if any of you remember that, but uh, it's now Shekinah Worship. Um, And I remember her coming back, and I remember her with this smile on her face, and she was full of joy. And she told me she gave her life to the Lord. I didn't know what that meant, but I could see that she had this joy on her. And great, I was happy for her, and we went inside, and it was all good. And the next day, she says, hey, I'm, I'm... I'm going back to that revival. I'm like, you just went last night. What do you, what do you mean you're going again? Yeah, it's all week. I'm like, that just seems crazy. So she went. And she came back again, and she was the same way, full of joy. And I remember the, the third night, she said, hey, go, go with me. Well, a lot of men in the world today would say, no, I'm not going. But I loved my wife. I absolutely did. At that point, we'd been together five years. We had a two-year-old baby, and I was in love with her. And I, yeah, yeah, if you want me to go, absolutely, I will go. And I couldn't tell you who was speaking or what he was saying, but I can tell you that, that at 25 years old, I knew 100% that I was going to hell. There was no hope for me. That is where I was bound, that I was the poster boy for hell, that, you know, as, as Paul said, he's the uh, Pharisee of all Pharisees. I felt like I was the sinner of all sinners. Um, but I knew I'm going to hell. And he gave that altar call. And I went up there. And I have no idea what they were doing behind me. I'm sure they were happy. Maybe they were crying. But I went up and I made that altar call and I gave my life to the Lord. And. But I still knew I had a problem. I had a drug addiction for five years that I had not been able to get off of. So I, after we prayed, we went in the back room and a guy explained to me what I just did and, and what happened and great and I'm going to give you a Bible. And, uh, and then he talked to me about the Holy Spirit. And he said, you know, God has provided a comforter for us that comes along beside us. And he's a helper. And it's the Holy Spirit. Would you like to receive the Holy Spirit? In my mind, I'm thinking, I need everything I can get. I am hurting. And uh, so I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So we prayed together, and I began speaking in tongues. And he explained to me what that was. And I left there still thinking, I got this, how am I going to deal with this? I never had a craving for drugs again. I mean, the next day, none. I didn't think about it once. And it went. Because of that, no matter what happens in the rest of my life, which there's a lot more, I know that God is real. And there's nothing that any atheist or anybody can tell me that God does not exist. Because it's impossible. I know this was a miracle. This was real. I spoke in tongues and I was delivered from drugs, something I couldn't do for myself for five years. God is real. Anyway, we immersed ourselves in that church. But we were baby Christians. And we were, we were in the little waiting pools, all we were doing. But we were going. We went Sunday mornings. They had service Sunday nights. They had service Wednesdays. They had special speakers on other nights. We did not miss. We attended constantly. We tithed. We went to classes that they had. I, I, it was... I needed all that I could get, and I was getting all that I could get. And, and it was amazing. God was beginning to bless us, to open our eyes to what was around us, but we were only educating ourselves with the church. We weren't educating ourselves with the word and what was in the word. And that being said, three years after going to the church, I had come to the conclusion that I I worked in construction and I had a good job, but my future options were limited. Being an ex-felon, or a felon currently, still am, um, it really limited my job options. I had friends going to work for Lockheed and Rockwell and the fire department and the police department, and I couldn't take any of those jobs. I couldn't even get past, I couldn't even get them to accept my application once I put on there that I was convicted of a felony. And so... 
here I am working construction, but I'm working next to some 50-year-old guys that are broken down, and I'm thinking, that's what I'm going to look like if I don't do something about it. And so we decided that I'm going to get into the car business, that I'm going to sell cars. That's something that's not going to break me down, and I'm going to be able to continue to do it as I get older, and uh, that's a good thing. Well, I was pretty naive to some things, but learned quickly. Her, her mother laughed because I was a drug addict introvert that didn't talk to anybody, and she's like, my daughter's going to starve. <laughs> this guy can't sell cars. <laughs> but we did all right. But... The, looking back, the first miracle was I even got a sales license because now you can't get a sales license with a felony. And I don't know how I got one then, but they gave me one and it was issued and it came to me with probationary stamped on it. And I've never seen another sales license in 30 years that has probationary stamped on it. So it had to be God. Unfortunately, I didn't keep pursuing. I got into a, a job that I did very well at and that paid good money, and it paid good money the harder you worked. So next thing you know what, I'm working 80 to 100 hours a week. I don't see my kids. I am not, we are not going to church. We are not plugged in. We are not involved. And I am now chasing the American dream. More, 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 more. And we lived a long time like that, chasing the American dream. Actually, to the point that we thought we had it made. We thought, you know, we've arrived. Boats, Harleys, cars, house, we got it all. From the world standard, we were success. And I felt like this is what's life all about, but, but there was a huge hole. There was something missing that there was no contentment in my life, that I just had to keep chasing the bigger house, the bigger car, the better bike. The, everything had to be bigger and better, and there was no end to it because we were trying to fill a hole, and it couldn't be filled. But I didn't know that. I began to not care about my wife. That life was only about me. That that's all that matters. Can anybody relate to that? Is, is life about you? Because I lived there a long time. And, and I won't say that it's just me because I think she felt life was about her and I think everybody to some point feels that life is about them. That God wants me to be happy, I need to be happy. You know, there, there's some time for me, something for me. And, and I was obsessed with it. Um, to the point that my marriage didn't matter, nothing mattered, I was only concerned with what I wanted. I was lost. All over again, I was lost. And at that point in my life, I was addicted to everything. Not, not drugs, but I drank, addicted to pornography. I'd had that with me since I was 11 years old. Um, some would call me a serial adulterer. I was very bad until I got caught. And then life began to fall apart because it's, do I have a marriage? Do I have... You know, we, we went through what I feel like most people in their right mind would have said, I'm done with this. But somewhere deep inside, we both knew that God's absolute best, and maybe it was greed on our part that we wanted God's absolute best. We didn't want to compromise, but we knew that God's absolute best was only going to come if we stayed together. So we're going to work this out. And... She says one day, and I don't know, she says, hey, I got this Bible, let's read through the Bible in a year, and I'm going to read it. Now, at this point, we'd believed in God a long time, and we went to church pretty solidly but for three years, but we'd never really read the Bible, so I'm like, you know what, I'll read it with you. So we did. We read through the same Bible in a year. And while I will tell you it changed me, I can't tell you that it, it transformed my life, and and. Since then, we have never put it down, I can tell you that, that getting in that habit of reading that 15 to 20 minutes a day is what it initially it was, but getting in that habit developed a habit that now 15, 16 years later, it's more of an addiction that now we'll read for an hour to two hours a day um, because we can't get enough. 
But that first year kicked it in. But God gradually began to make changes in, in our lives, in my life especially, but it wasn't, we weren't going to church regularly. In fact, filling ourselves full of the word kind of made us judgmental. We could look on other Christians and say, oh, that's what they're doing wrong, and that's what they're doing wrong. We'd go to a church and, oh, I don't like this, or that's wrong, and we could pick anybody apart. And it, it was all a lie from the devil to keep us out of church, and we just, we thought we were smart. We thought, no, we read the word. We know what the word is. We know what God wants. We know who he wants us to be, but we were, we were out in left field. Knowledge isn't power, <laughs> always. Um, but we found reasons why we didn't like them. In fact, we came to Shane's church six years ago on a Saturday night, and, and I liked him. I told her, I said, that guy's really hard. I said, I like him, but a lot of people wouldn't. But then we got busy on a remodel, and somehow I used that as an excuse that, hey, I don't have time to go. I, I don't, it was doing it on Saturday nights. I don't know how that interferes with a remodel, but it did. And we quit going. <laughs> the, um, so we had the word in our lives, but we had no fruit in our lives. And we were still chasing the American dream. We were reading the Bible and telling all the things that it says not to do, but we weren't doing it. We were, we were in debt. We embraced debt like most of Americans. And, you know, we, we wanted what everybody else had. That was, that, you know, we, we had that mentality that God wants to bless us. And this is how he's blessing us, by us being choked by a monthly payment. By the way, it's a monthly payment that is a, a total distraction from God because I don't see how we can give our whole selves to God when we are burdened with debt. Um, so this church right here, because we, we attended Central for a while and we attended the Highlands a little bit, but we'd each find a reason that we didn't, we, we didn't feel like we fit in. We didn't feel like we belonged. And, uh, and I personally know the pastor out at Lancaster Baptist. And while I wouldn't go out there, I know Paul personally. I know a son-in-law who I love. The guy is an unbelievable guy. Peter Mord, if you ever get a chance to meet him, he is a phenomenal man, a great Christian. But he started a satellite of Lancaster Baptist over by Rancho Vista High School. It's called New Hope. And um, they were starting it. They let us know. We said, hey, we'll go check it out. And... We went one time, the first time they had a service, and we both looked at each other and said, that's, that's not going to work. It's not for us. And then uh, it was right around election time a couple of years ago, and Shane, that passionate guy, was talking about the importance of voting your conscience, and, and I'm listening, and she's on the thing, and I'm like, that, sounds like, that guy sounds familiar. She's like, who's that, Shane? And I'm like, we both looked at each other, and we're like, yeah, we need to go back to his church. And she's like, well, he's in Leona Valley now. I said, okay, that was about two years ago. So we did, and we have been coming ever since. Pain, Shane's passion is contagious. Passion is contagious, and his passion is contagious, and his passion, if I'm the only one in the world that he inspired, I thank God that he did. And this church and the body that's in this church, you all have made a difference in my life, and, and my life in the last two years has changed more than it has in the 30 years prior that I would have called myself a Christian. And, and it's, and I'll share with you some things that, that I've discovered, but God's put things on my heart and he, and he has spoke to me many times. He just lays it on my heart and I know it, know it's there and he did that back when I first got saved and I've always known that God is real. And 15 years ago, while, I was start, while we were reading the word and praying, he's laying on my heart to get rid of the television and quit drinking. Well, I liked drinking, but I, didn't, I wasn't an alcoholic, so I'm like, I could do that, but I'm like, the TV? I said, I still got a kid at home, and my wife watches it all the time. I'm like, I, I mentioned it to my wife, and she's pretty sure I'm not hearing from God. <laughs> so about a month after that, our TV breaks, and I go out and buy another one. <laughs> and we've bought two TVs since then. <laughs> but recently, since I've been back here, now the whole time, 15 years, you could ask me things that God's put on my heart, and I would tell you that God's told me to get rid of the TV as the TV's playing in the background. 
And, but, so, the, drink, quit drinking. Okay, I'll quit drinking. I quit drinking for a year. And, and I wasn't sure what I was trying to prove, because they did, and it wasn't a problem, because I wasn't an alcoholic. I just drank occasionally. And so then I just went back to drinking. And I didn't drink very much. I mean, I drink two times a month, maybe, a couple beers. It wasn't, uh, to me, it was no big deal. And I'm reading in the Bible, hey, this is okay. It tells me it's okay. I'm not a, I'm not a preacher. I'm, I'm good. But when God lays something on your heart, it's not, it's not about whether it's in the Bible or not. It's about, is that what you're called to do? Now, he's calling me. I know he's calling me. He's been calling me. He keeps laying down these things for me to be obedient to, and it's my choice. Am I or not? And, and for years, I was not. Um, so he starts laying on my heart these things again, and, and I'm trying to understand why, and, and, but I do. Shane calls the fast in February. He wants a three-week fast, and Lori and I say, okay, we're gonna cut out we're going to cut out breakfast. And she's like, well, that's too easy. I said, okay. How about we cut out meat? That's a little more difficult. Because I'd been reading a lot about plant-based diets. I was curious. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming how good it is for you. But the thought of giving up meat is like, come on. So, okay, three weeks. We can do three weeks. I can give up meat. Um, turned out to be one of the easiest things I've ever done. That just, giving up meat was not a problem. I think it's all in our head that we have to have it because it was actually very easy. Um, now, I will tell you that giving up dairy and cheese, there's something in cheese. I, they say it's, I, I looked it up because three months later, I'm thinking about cheese and I'm drooling out of the side of my mouth going, what's going on? Why am I addicted to cheese? And it's, there's an opioid in cheese. No wonder it's addicting. And it's, it's the casein that's condensed in cheese that makes it more addicting than regular dairy. Very bad. But getting rid of dairy eliminated 30 years of allergies that I had every year that would just plague me to where I'd have to go get allergy shots, and all of a sudden, I don't have to do that anymore. Be obedient to God. The TV has been a struggle, but it is currently not on and hasn't been on. There still is one in my house, and I still pay for direct TV, which every month I'm like, why do we pay for direct TV? We don't even watch it. <laughs> and it's, it's getting turned off. <laughs> she, <laughs> I lead. <laughs> the... The other thing that, and this is something I haven't shared with her, but she'll learn this now, but about <laughs> December, January, God woke me up in the middle of the night and he reminded me of a church because one of my things, you know, when I was younger, I had a list. I had a list of everything that people would pay me for. I knew what I could make money on and there was always garden equipment on the list. Well, churches are the best place. There's nobody there at night. You can break down the shed and you can take whatever you want as long as they don't have a gardener. And I did that a lot. But for some reason, God just woke me up and he said, remember that church, one church on Avenue K. And I'm like, yeah, I remember that church. I don't even know if it's still there. He's like, you know what, you're, you're, you're gonna pay them back for what you took. I'm like, okay, all right, I'm gonna be obedient. He says, uh, he just puts it on my heart because you're gonna give a thousand bucks. But it was only five hundred dollars worth of stuff. What do you? A thousand dollars? I'm trying to negotiate with him a little bit here, and it, it wasn't going away. It was a thousand bucks. So, three weeks it took me to convince myself that that was God, and and He constantly was just it was bombarding me constantly. It would not go away. So I'm like, all right, be obedient. Put the check in an envelope, mail it. Well, in the three weeks, let me tell you what I did. And I probably did what every one of you would do. I looked up who the ministry was. It wasn't the same church. It was a completely different church. Been sold many times. And, and I'm looking it up, and I'm looking at these people, and I'm like, well, how do I know they're good stewards? Their body's very small. They can't be good stewards. I, how can I give to somebody that's not a good steward? It's not funny. <laughs> and God's just putting it on my heart. He's like, what they do with the money is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to be obedient Yes, Lord. Check went in the envelope, went in the mail. 
I'm checking my bank account. It never gets cashed. I'm like, oh, God was just testing me. He's not going to cash that check. <laughs> Two months later, I get a phone call. Hey, we just got our mail, and there's this check in it. Is it good? Yes, it's good. <laughs> and away the money went. She didn't know the story, but I probably didn't need to explain it to her. She would have trusted me to do what I was led to do. And I appreciate that in my wife. Um, in the midst of all this, I have learned some things. And, and it is really... The number one thing is to be obedient to God all the time. You, you get that. You know what that feeling is that lies on your heart, and you know what that conviction is that you say, I just feel compelled to do this. Do it. Do it, because even if it makes no sense to you, and even if it shows, it's like there's no, it does, there's no fruit. Why am I doing this? It's, it's obedience. You know, God doesn't tempt us, but he does test us. And, and that obedience is going to take us to wherever God has us to go. And I want to be obedient to God because I only want to be in his will. I gave up my will a long time ago. My will has not produced uh, satisfaction, contentment. It can't produce any of the things that God gives me. Peace. And that's, that's the will I want to follow. He's also put on my heart that, that I am to help men that are struggling with marriages and addictions. And I am starting a Pure Desires uh, course in, uh, on October 9th that, you know what, if God's tugging on your heart right now that you should probably be in there, it's gonna meet every other Tuesday night is a four men only group where we can hold each other accountable and iron sharpens iron and we can move forward in the calling of God and use God's word to overcome addiction. So I would encourage you to join that if you want, but these are some truths that have just, uh, over the years, and especially looking back, there's things that I wish I could change, things that I certainly would change, but I can't. Um, the first one is that your kids watch what you do, not what you say. They listen to you, and they hear the tone in your voice, they, they, that matters. But what you do, they are watching and they see you. Now, I have an older daughter that I just can't reach now. And, and that's my fault. Because I wasn't the example of a father or a husband that I should have been. And we are good friends, but we can't talk about God. And, and that, that is a burden on my wife and I both. Because we have two grandsons. And now a 12-year-old grandson who claims to be an atheist, thanks to his father. But I have a special relationship with him, and I get to share with him one-on-one. -on -one and um, pray for me, because I have just got her, his mother's blessing to talk to him about going to Ensenada on the mission trip with me. So I am hoping that that happens, but whatever her choice is, God's plan is bigger. Um, the next thing I've learned, and I learned this the hard way, is that your spouse is the most important living person on this earth. You know, if Jesus were on this earth, he would trump her or him, but physical person on this earth, nobody is more important, and that's something that I got twisted up in my head because... I, grandkids, I mean, if you have grandkids, you, I don't have to explain the love that you feel for them. It is unbelievable, and it is very easy to place them above your spouse, and it's the wrong place for them to be. It's not proportionate, and your reactions to your spouse will affect that, and once you place her or him where they belong, everything else in marriage works out. See, I, I learned in a, in a marriage study that we did that that most marriages in today, and most, the reason that most marriages fail is that people go into the marriage with the expectation that you are gonna make my life better. You're bringing something to the table that I can't bring to the table, and you're gonna make my life better. Well, that's an unrealistic expectation. If your life's bad, it's because you made it bad, and if your life's good, it's because you're making it good, and you have Christ in your life. 
your expectation in that marriage needs to be that I am going to make their life better. And if both of you have that approach, you have a bulletproof marriage. Um, The other thing that I'm about to read you, I did not want to read, but God is not going to let me not read it. And that is sin begins in your mind. And all sin starts there. And God woke me up in the middle of the night, I don't know, six months ago. And began, I felt like I was drinking from a fire hose because he was just dumping words on me. I was, I was overwhelmed. I had to get up and I had to start writing. And I'm not a journaler. This is page two in my journal is where this started. But I'm going to read this and hopefully it does not offend anybody, but this bears so much witness with my soul and hopefully it does with you as well. It says, sin separates us from God. A man and a wife are joined together in one flesh. Nowhere does God condone sex outside of marriage. One flesh. Intimate relationship between man and wife. Flee from sexual morality, thinking, seeking, speaking, or acting. Sexual immorality is any sex outside of marriage. Sin starts in the mind and meditation turns it into the desires of the heart. And then we think it must be from God. Does this mean that God's words are wrong? No, we're wrong. Sin is the time between temptation and taking that thought captive. So as soon as that thought enters into your mind, you are currently in sin. So how long are we going to spend there? Seconds, hours, days, years, a lifetime? God doesn't want us there. If sin separates us from God, how can we stay there and say we belong to him? Are there levels of sexual sin? Adultery, any sex outside of marriage. Pornography, lust, same as adultery. Incest, lust, adultery. Sexual child abuse, it's illegal. Still lust and adultery. And homosexuality was death in the Old Testament. All sexual immorality is sin. It may have a levels of offense to us, but not to God. Adultery and homosexuality were both punished by death, and now they are legal, in many cases acceptable. We are all born with sexual immoral nature. All of us are guilty of sexual immorality. Do we excuse it and say, I was born this way? It's how God made me? If we do... We claim God's word to be void, that God's word isn't truth, and we eat the fruit of the forbidden tree and say, I'm right, but God is still God and unchanged. When will we repent and turn from our sins, first to Jesus for forgiveness and then to the Holy Spirit for the help we need? We are not born homosexual, pedophiles, adulterer, addicted to pornography. We become that way by meditating on these thoughts till it fills our hearts and pours out of us. It's what comes out of us that defiles us. Getting to the point that we believe we were born like this takes time, lots of time. And in most cases, it's gonna take lots of time to change it. We must take our thoughts captive and meditate on the things, that which is holy, pure, decent. The same process that leads us into sin can lead us out of sin. So change your thoughts and that will change your heart. The next thing I've learned is where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And that finally became true to me when, you know, even when we started coming here, we still had all the things that the world would say made us successful. Anything we wanted, we had. And from a man's point of view, I had a garage full of very nice custom classic cars and that I never drove. They were idols. And, and, and they became a burden to me. The more I got plugged into this church, the more they became a burden. The more that every time I saw them, I thought, well, I need to clean that car. I need to wash that car. I need to, all these time commitments. And I'm like, I don't want to. So God put it on my heart to get rid of them. I'm like, all right, fine. 
And then we sold them all. And I have not missed them. Matter of fact, I walk in the garage now and I smile because there's nothing in there that needs to be washed. <laughs> it's pretty nice. But, but there's more to it. You know, Shane doesn't talk about tithing, but that will change your life. That will change your life. If you give, give till it hurts. And give, don't give a little, give what you can, but give a lot and make it a priority and make it first. And your heart will follow. If you're giving to this church, your heart will be here. You will follow. It's unavoidable. And, and the word's very clear in that. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. That's, and I didn't realize that. I just started giving because I knew I was supposed to, but all of a sudden I found that everything about me was changing over that one thing. Honestly, it has helped me uh, to overcome or to deal with the pornography issue because it's like, you know what? I've got this relationship going with God. I don't, I don't want this in the way. This is gonna screw things up. So, Away you go. Um, so if you're not tithing, I would encourage you to tithe. Make it that important. Because in God's eyes, it's more important than everything. Um, and it's not that he wants your money and he needs your money, but he wants your heart. And he needs your heart. And, and we have a lot of roadblocks that stop us from putting our heart out there to God. God has laid it on my heart as I come here on, on Sunday mornings at six o'clock, which I agree with Shane. That is, if I, I may, I've missed Sunday service, but not missed six o'clock in the morning. It's that good. And he's just laid on my heart that as we are here before him, that he hears our cries. And that as we are crying and reaching out to him, he is reaching out even harder to us. And that we just need to be still. And know that he's God. That he is here and he hears us. Now, I know that God forgives me of all of my sins, as many as they were. But I also know that he has not eliminated the consequences of those sins. Um, and I pay the price for those. I pay the price um, with my daughter. I pay the price with losing my job. I, w I lost my job over a sexual relationship. And that was not easy. That was humbling. Um, that was a consequence of sin. And it, and it was a prior. It wasn't even existing when it happened, but I knew that it happened. I could not deny that it happened. I had to be honest about it. And, and it cost me my job. But at the time, I was in the word and I was moving forward. But that was a consequence of sin. And we don't want the consequences of sin. Because the ultimate consequence of sin is death that we can't, we don't want to pay that price. Now, I can tell you that, that reading the word of God has been a big impact on my life. But there's so much more to it. And I would encourage you that you, you cannot grow in Christ without reading the word of God yourself. You can't come here on Sunday and say that change reading the word of God to me. That's not enough. You have to know the word, you have to read the word, you have to continually be in it and have a passion about it, but there's more to it because we were in the word for years, but we resembled the world. There was no fruit. You, other than having crosses all over our walls in our house, you would not know that we were Christians, not by our language, not by the way we drank, not by anything about us. The shows that we watched on TV, there was nothing about us that resembled Christianity. And we were in the word for years, for years, I, I, I don't brag that I've, been, that I've read the word so many times. I claim that I have ADD and I have to read the word because I forget it. So it's, it's constantly new to me, which is a good thing. But there's been so much more to it that I only got from this church. You know, part of it is fellowship with everybody here. That has been, that has made all the difference to other people that are facing and living the same things that we live, that we can strengthen each other, that we can come along beside each other and help each other. And that has been a great encouragement. Small groups. If you are not a part of a Bible study or a small group, get in one. Even if you don't like the subject, you're gonna like the people. And you're gonna get hooked because now it's like, all right, what small group's going on? Well, all right, I can't join the women's basket weaving group. That's not for me. But, but I'm looking. <laughs> are, are men welcome? 
it's because I can't get enough of it because that has been a huge growing point. And there's a lot of groups going on. You know, currently they have the worldview study going on. There's a men's Bible study at Alice's on Saturday mornings. There is the uh, Pure Desires group that I'm starting on every other Tuesday and then rotating Tuesdays from that. There's the, the health, health accountability group, which that group's been awesome. I mean, Karen does a phenomenal job with that and, and that's her calling and she does a great job. I would encourage you to go to that. <laughs> um, but there's so many more. There's, they're posted on the bulletin constantly and you need to get involved. If you're not getting the bulletin, you need to fill that card out and start getting it because the information that's on there can change your life if you let it, if you reach out and do something with it. So be involved. We all have a part in the body of Christ and we're not all the head. Some of us are a toe, but if we don't do anything, I'm okay, I'll be a toe. I'm a toe, I don't care. But I know that I have a part and I know that I belong in this body and that we all do, we function together. And you need to find your spot. And sometimes you find that spot by just reaching out and start volunteering, start being active, get involved in stuff because you're gonna find something that you're passionate about and you're, and you're, and you're gonna get contagious and you're gonna find your spot in the body. But you have to act. The church isn't gonna come to you and say, hey, I think you're called to do this. You should do, no, just get out there and do it and you're gonna find your spot. Um, the last thing and I, is I know that that we just have to repent daily. Even if we don't think we did anything wrong, I assure you we didn't do everything right. And you just gotta get on your knees before God and humble yourself and submit yourself to his will daily. God, just take my will from me and your will be done because he, my plans are, are fruitless. But his plans they just bring contentment and peace and all the things that no matter what you have in the world, it can't bring. They, they, they think they have it um, because they have a little bit of money, but there's so much burden on their lives and, and you shouldn't have burden. We're not designed to carry that burden. You're designed to worship God, to fellowship with God constantly and those burdens in life distract you from doing that. They take away your mind, they take away what you're thinking on and they, and they keep you focused on something other than God and God wants your attention. That's why we were created to fellowship with him, just give him your attention. That's really all he wants. If you give him your attention, you're gonna be where he wants you to be. You're gonna be doing what he wants you to do. You're gonna find yourself in, your, in his will and you're gonna find yourself hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, God has a plan for every one of our lives and God had a plan for my life even as a kid, even walking into a house full of drug needles and overdosed people. God had a plan for my life then and I had no clue what it was but we have to remember that Satan's also got a plan for your life and Satan was very active in my life trying to derail me constantly which to me, I just feel that, that that's just telling me that God's, God's got a big plan for my life and I wanna be there and I wanna do it and and. It doesn't matter if I've wasted 40 years from it. God's still going to use me, and he still has a plan. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you. We thank for all your saints gathered here with you, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that you would just pour out onto our hearts, Lord, your will for our lives, Lord. Pour out onto our hearts constantly the areas that we need to examine, Lord, that we need to say, is this of God? Is this of you? Do you want me to cut this out of my life? And then be obedient, Lord. It's those constant steps of obedient, Lord, that, that brings us closer to you and closer to your will for our lives. We thank you and praise you for your wonderful glory and your wonderful son in Jesus' name. Amen.